Okay, so um, tonight we're going to have a multi-presenter presentation. Uh, Julie Combs, Dr. Julie Combs will be our first speaker tonight. She joined the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in June of 20. 2021, and she serves as a species lead for a suite of at-risk invertebrates, including butterflies, uh, bumblebees, and moths. She has over 20 years experience in ecology, insect conservation, and botany. Prior to joining WDFW, she served as senior conservation scientist at Cascadia Conservation LLC working with state and federal partners to implement research studies um, focused on rare and endangered insects and plants in Washington state. She completed her BS in um, environmental biology and policy management at US Davis and her uh, master's degree and PhD degrees in ecology and conservation from the School of Environment and Forest Sciences at the University of Washington. Additionally, uh, in addition to all of those accolades, she uh, was awarded an NSF, National Science Foundation Fellowship, to conduct research in South Africa, Chile, and China, where she studied co-evolutionary and behavior interactions amongst um, plants and pollinators. So we're very happy to have you with us tonight, Julie. Our second speaker will be Ross Winton. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in wildlife management and a master's degree in entomology, both from Montana State University. Since 2019, he has served as invertebrate biologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, where he was responsible for all freshwater, subterranean, and terrestrial invertebrates of Texas, over 65,000 species. That's a job including invasive species and their impact on the natural environment. Prior to that, he was with um, the Idaho uh, Department of Fish and Game, where he was responsible for the management of all non-game classified species in South Central Idaho. And he has also worked with game species such as uh, sage grouse, elk, and pronghorn. He has um, a great deal of depth and experience in invertebrate uh, ecology, surveying, recovery planning, and conservation management. He got a start at an early age uh, using the Blue Pile Field Manual, 1980, circa 1981, and has now detoured back to beetle and uh, bee conservation. He's excited to be back working with butterflies in the Pacific Northwest. And our third presenter tonight, I think all of you know, is uh, Regina Johnson, our uh, Washington Butterfly Association treasurer, and also the editor of our newsletter, The Ganam. So thank you um, for being with us tonight, Julie, Ross, uh, and Regina. So Julie, why don't you go ahead and get started and share your screen? Sure, let me see here. How's that? Can you see it? Not yet. It's coming on. That? Yep. We okay. Is that the is that the full screen? Not you can't see the slides on the side. It's full. It's full screen. Yes. Okay. Great. I'm. Uh, well, we're so excited to be here tonight. It. Um. I have. I started with WDFW three years ago, and it's been a long time coming. I've worked. Been working closely with John Pelham. Uh, Pyle, Caitlin Labar, uh, Regina Johnson, and several other people um, to get up to speed and learn about butterflies over the last three years. Uh, and so I'm excited to have Ross Winton on board. He joined us um, just recently and has a wealth of background in invertebrate conservation and biology. So um, I will just jump in here. We're here to talk about Washington butterfly conservation updates and specifically uh, Ross and Regina and I want to talk about observational reporting methods, um, which is a key part of um, what we would like to cover tonight. So an out, just brief outline. So I'd like to first start with uh, WDFDO's mission and talk a little bit about our state wildlife action plan. And then I'll present a list of our 21 species of greatest conservation need butterflies of Washington. Uh, we'll talk about highlights of current SGCN conservation work, um, covering monitoring, surveying, 
habitat enhancement, restoration, and also um, research that WDFW is engaged with many partners um, currently and uh, in the past, recent past. Uh, Ross and I really want to drive home to tonight that um, our wildlife database has significant gaps in it and focus on the importance of sharing data. And again, Regina and Ross and I are going to talk about the best reporting methods to do this. Um, specifically, we're going to focus on the WDFW at-risk reporting app, which I think is fairly easy to use. I'll run through it uh, tonight. Uh, and Regina is going to cover the iNaturalist uh, Washington State Butterfly uh, Project. I'm actually going to start my timer because Regina and I, I think we've decided we have about 20 minutes each. Um, so just started my timer here. Um, and then I also want to hear uh, from the group about your ideas for reporting, um, perhaps publishing trips on trip butterfly lists uh, from your trips on the website or data to John, Julie, Ross, uh, or um, I know that John um, has a template data sheet that has all the information. Um, if you just don't like being online um, and you're more comfortable working with Excel sheets, even getting that information in, in an Excel sheet that has the date, uh, the lat long and some basic information and getting that information to us, um, that's also an option. But really curious to have conversations at the end of this uh, and hear about your ideas. So the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, our agency's mission is to preserve, protect, uh, and perpetuate fish, wildlife, and ecosystems while providing sustainable fish and wildlife, recreational and commercial opportunities. Ross and I are with the Diversity Vision, which is the smallest uh, program in the larger group of the wildlife, of the Fish and Wildlife Department. And our division is specifically focused on leading efforts uh, to manage, conserve, and recover Washington's non-game wildlife um, and plays, we play an active role in protecting improving habitat. So a large part of what we do is species focused, but a, a, a very large, a, a complementary part of that is um, habitat restoration uh, and maintaining healthy ecosystems uh, for um, species to thrive in. Um, a big part of what we do is we assess species distribution, abundance, population trends, and threats, and we make recommendations for their recovery. We work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, with uh, nonprofits, with universities, um, lots of community partners are involved uh, in this process. Uh, and really, our conservation mission uh, is our trust and our responsibility to current and future peoples uh, of Washington State. So I mentioned that we have 21, uh, we have 21 SGCN, Species of Greatest conservation, conservation Need Butterflies of Washington State. Uh, I, I do wanna recognize that the first uh, statewide conservation status assessment for butterflies was conducted by Bob Pyle in 1989. It was a 217 page uh, document um, where we actually designated the first 13 SGCN species. So. Um, Bob was instrumental, instrumental in providing guidance to the state uh, with identifying SGCN species. Um, and um, out of the, we had mentioned earlier, if you, I don't know if you were here earlier, but uh, we mentioned that a large part of the SGCN species are on the west side. We have five um, SGCN butterflies on the east side. Uh, our State Wildlife Action Plan, or SWAP, is updated every 10 years, and the new one is coming. So Ross and I are getting geared up and excited to um, uh, consider assessments and revisit um, uh, our findings uh, from, from the 2015 SWAP. And the updates and revisions are required every 10 years uh, to ensure continued eligibility for state wildlife uh, grant programs, which is uh, one of our funding pots. We have 268 SGCN species, 95 invertebrates, 21 of those are butterflies. And you can see this list, there's a whole his, list of um, a deep dive into conservation status, biology, distribution, stressors, needs, 
And we also look at climate change and monitoring and adaptive management in our swap. Um, and you can find that online if you want to learn more. This is the list of the 21 uh, butterfly species. And these are the ones that we are going to be recommending that you report uh, on the WDFW uh, at-risk species app. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit um, coming up here, but the iNaturalist is really for all butterflies. Um, but we tonight, we're really focusing on promoting, if you see one of these 21 uh, species um, using that at-risk reporting app, uh, the information will come immediately to Ross or myself, and that information will be in included uh, in our uh, wisdom database. Uh, wisdom is a wildlife species data management uh, database. So that's our main database. And I want to provide an example here looking at this map. And this is one example of uh, how limited our current database is. And so just to give you some idea, this database is maybe 10 to 15 years old. Uh, the department really ignored invertebrates for a very long time. Um, Ann Potter, my predecessor, uh, was really pushed for um, developing a database for invertebrates. And so um, we are sort of at the beginning of that. And um, I arrived three years ago. I met John Pelham and many others, and he and I have been sharing data, and he has been uh, he has been uh, instrumental uh, in really expanding uh, our database uh, to really look at the distribution and abundance of species. So um, our data biologist, uh, Sarah Kroc, made this map today. And I want to just walk you through. Um, this is, I call it the Pelham batch data. And this is just for 11 of the SGN species that Sarah is just now finishing putting into our database. The yellow dots are uh, Pelham's data that um, comes from lots of different sources. So thanks to John, WBA, members, iNaturalist, and everyone who contributed to these points. Um, John incorporated these historic uh, points as well as crowdsourced data and, and um, data from WBA uh, members. John. Any other data sources? Did I cover those? Uh, no, you got it. I mean, you know, like my personal history and uh, history of uh, the people that I grew up with, but you you got it, that's it. Okay, okay. So um, you can see in the table here, what was in our, the numbers that were in our wisdom database of these 11 and then how, um, you know, 1,189 points that, uh, as of next week, this will be uploaded into our database. Um, so this is the last of the 21 species that we are working on. Um, it has taken Sarah three weeks to enter the data for this 11 species because much of this batch data comes in on, some of it comes in an Excel spreadsheet, but some of it is in Word documents. So this is another reason why using the apps, using iNaturalist is we're really promoting these means of moving data around because it is just extremely time consuming and laborious uh, to um, transcribe data. On to just a couple of highlights for me. Um, and I can see that uh, I, I have about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna go through these slides. I wanna really highlight Island Marble, which I've been working quite a bit on. And I'll touch a little bit on uh, Mardon Skipper. I wanted to talk about Macaw Copper, but I'm just not gonna have time tonight. But I'll start with Island Marble. And many of you are familiar with this. Some of you took a field trip last year uh, up to um, San Juan Island. But Island Marble collected uh, San Juan Island National Historic Park in 1998. Uh, it was an unnamed subspecies previously known from Vancouver Island and Gabriola Island uh, in Canada, last seen in 1908. 2001, Guppy and Shepherd formally described uh, the subspecies Euchloe asinides in Solanus. And currently, it is restricted to one population on San Juan Island. Uh, and the listing and uh, history is quite extensive. Uh, Xerxes petitioned to list the species 
almost 15 years ago. So it has been a long time in the making. The federal government finally listed the species uh, in uh, 2020, May 5th. And the state, well, we are uh, currently in the process of listing it. Um, I have drafted uh, the um, status report and it will be moving out soon to the general public for comments. And then I will be uh, in front of the commission to recommend it as endangered at the state level. Um, Island Marble has three host plants, Brassica rapa, uh, Lepidium virginicum, and Cicimbrium altissimum, all mustards. Uh, uh, this is a pyrid species, and like many pyrid species, uh, they are co-evolved with mustards uh, that harbor gluco glucosinolates, so they have a chemical uh, relationship uh, with their host plants. The Island Marble occurs in three different habitats, grasslands, lagoons, and dunes. And the primary threats for the species are habitat loss, mainly by plant succession is probably one of the most, the highest threats right now um, is the loss of the grassland habitat just because you need disturbance and the National Park Service uh, as um, doing some restoration, uh, but they are limited what they can do. Uh, they're in the process of compliance and working on uh, vegetation management plans now. Um, Predation, deer bivory, and, and just the fact that it's a small population size um, makes it vulnerable um, to extinction. Much of the research has been conducted by uh, Dr. Amy Lambert, her dissertation, uh, and um, also she worked on the species uh, for research 2014 to 2017 for the National Park Service. Uh, these are some images of spiders that I took just last year. So spiders continue to be a very large component um, of the mortality of this species. Hmm. Island marble. Um, so there have been adults trying to track adult abundance um, is, is very tricky. Um, so there has been transects set up over time. We have over 20, 20 years of data looking at transects, and some of these transects have been continuously monitored um, for this 20-year period, and those are the, the transects you see on the graph. Uh, the blue line represents total encounter rates. So while we can't say anything about total butterfly numbers, we can look at relative abundance. So in this case, we're looking uh, at numbers of butterfly, butterflies per 100 meters of transect at four uh, sentinel locations at American camp. And the trend line, as you can see, shows consistent uh, decline, uh, decline over time. Um, this work is from uh, Dr. Lambert's work, as well as transect monitoring from agencies. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife just published in 2023, uh, the Island Marble Butterfly Species Biological Report, the Recovery Plan, and the Recovery Implementation uh, Strategies. These are three documents that sort of uh, work with each other uh, to um, form the foundation um, for moving forward uh, with recovery of the species. And uh, as I said, estimating abundance is challenging, um, but we're continuing with the transects of relative uh, uh, transects to look at adult relative abundance. Um, I just wanted to point out the low point here in 2013. This was a very scary year for Island Marble. Um, the National Park uh, Superintendent, uh, Gerald Weaver, uh, was extremely worried that this butterfly was going to go extinct. Uh, what triggered at that point was the need for a captive rearing program that started in 2014. And since 2000, the spring of 2015, 74 to 215 butterflies, adult butterflies have been released uh, at American camp. This is the, uh, a, Let's see, this, this, the image on the top right um, illustrates um, the landscape at American Camp. And let me tell you about that just in a second. But um, the research and monitoring 
of the adult abundance uh, hat, like I said, has been going on for 20 years. And just recently, uh, Fish and Wildlife and DFW have been collaborating on um, developing an occupancy and habitat study at American Camp. And so there's a, several components to what uh, we've been doing over the last um, couple of years. We're working on capturing uh, maps of host, mapping host plant habitat, doing rabbit habitat assessment, um, surveying presence and absence of immature stages at these three points over the season. And we're going to be using these, we're going to be using single occupancy models to estimate um, essentially the proportion of occupied to unoccupied grid cells. So the top right image, um, the yellow grids illustrate where you find lepidium uh, on the landscape. Um, so this is some host plant mapping that we have done previously to show where lepidium brassica and um, cecimbrium are located. The yellow, like I said, is uh, lepidium, um, the native host plant. And the two non-native mustards over to your right, and then the red is brassica. In the center is the dunes where cecimbrium uh, exists. And to the far right where the purple, that's in this area called old roadbed, which is a combination of, um, it has a mix of cecimbrium and brassica. And so essentially in starting in 2024, actually in a couple weeks, uh, this team that you're seeing pictures of, we were out there last year doing a pilot study um, using, uh, using uh, our uh, quick capture um, uh, handheld devices to collect um, data. And this year we plan to cover the whole park um, in habitat areas uh, to quantify um, eggs, eggs and larva. We'll do that at three points in the season. And then the idea is we're really trying to measure changes in habitat and also distribution in where the island larval is breeding, the eggs and larval stage across the landscape over time. So it's an alternative way. We'll be looking at the adult abundance, but we're also looking at um, egg and larval uh, patterns and how they change over time. So we can see if there's an increase or a decrease. So, and this is matching up with the goals of the recovery, which the Fish and Wildlife Service really wants a way to be able to track these changes over time. So we can uh, we can have a measurable uh, a measurable way to um, detect success uh, for recovery. Besides American Camp, there are a lot of partners that are working outside of uh, outside of. Uh, American camp on private land, but also on state land. So we have uh, Canada Conservations with Assurances sites. Um, our CCAA sites uh, in 2000, um, oops, sorry, oops, all right, so oops, sorry, my thing went. Um, in 2019, WDFW with Fish and Wildlife Service initiated a CCAA program and we had 22 enrollees across uh, San Juan Island and Lopez. And these partners um, agreed to either protect habitat, create habitat, and you can see in the right photo, there's some fencing around some mustard plants. And this is at the Fraser Preserve where San Juan County Land Bank, um, Kathleen Foley Lewis from the San Juan Island Preservation Trust is creating host plant habitat and protecting that habitat from deer using rotational strips of field mustard. And on the left-hand side, uh, we are, uh, you can see there's an image of Ann Potter, my predecessor, and Matt Hamer um, from WDFW. He was the previous district biologist there. They're monitoring uh, eggs on uh, tumble mustard. So DNR, David Wilderman at DNR, and WDFW, this is a collaborative project where they are doing the restoration and creating habitat, both native prairie uh, plants as well as the non-native mustard here to provide host plant habitat for island marble. And then annually, um, we are monitoring those plots. 
this is uh, the last image for Island Marble updates, but on April 13th, the first Island Marble sighting at two at 4.06 p.m. Uh, by Marianne Tyna at American Camp. Um, that's the image, uh, beautiful image on the left uh, on, um, on Dandelion. And uh, on the right, uh, this is Kurt and I, we were out at American Camp for a week last week to begin the adult transects and the egg monitoring, uh, which is in progress. And you can see all those little pink flags. Every where you see a pink flag, the, that is where um, an island marble egg is. And you can see there's a blow up image of Sisymbrium with a little orange egg. And in the right image, um, this is just a quick capture image um, of how we're recording the data in each of these plots. Uh, there's 20 um, five meter by five meter plots uh, on the DNR land, and we are tracking eggs, and we will track those eggs through um, survivorship to understand um, how our restoration uh, methods are working. Oh, there's my timer. Perfect timing. Um, so, how our restoration, uh, how our restoration methods uh, are um, uh, are progressing, and um, do we see survivorship? How much mortality do we see? So, these are the, some of the questions we're asking. Okay, one more, one more thing. Mardon Skipper genetics work highlight. So, uh, I want to talk about um, uh, when I first started three years ago. Um, my first task was to collaborate with others to write a competitive state wildlife grant, which this is a competitive uh, grant process with uh, all the states. And we received a grant for half a million dollars to work with partners across um, California, Washington, and Mexico in oak and prairie habitats. And some of the activities, habitat restoration, survey efforts, translocations, research. Um, this project uh, that I just have highlighted here, we just finished collecting Mardon Skipper um, tissue from the five distinct locations across its range. On the right-hand side, you can see those areas. The main goal of this is to really understand uh, and determine the degree of genetic isolation and ask if uh, uh, Polites Mardon Mardon, Polites Mardon Calamathensis, uh, and the undescribed uh, coastal units, um, are they genetically uh, distinct? Um, this is a question um, that Matt Forrester, Cass Carroll are addressing at UNR, and we're working with Xerces Society, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, UNR, um, our, and Eco Studies, NPS, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So a, a lot of partners. And before I hand it over to Ross, I just want to share one quick video of Molly Steele uh, releasing the Mardon Skipper. So this is a non-destructive non -destructive sampling method where we remove the center leg. So we remove two legs of Mardon Skipper and um, this is Molly releasing Mardon Skipper. So after it was released, we watch it for some time, and it turns out that, you know, uh, removal of the central leg uh, doesn't impact um, movability of the animal. And in fact, uh, more than half of the animals we collected that day, there was 15 of them that we collected, uh, legs were already missing. Um, so um, that was, uh, that was, that was uh, good to, to see. Oh, I didn't want to show that again. Let's see. Okay, so with that, I think Paulette, I think I'm just going to turn it over to Ross and then maybe we can ask questions after. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay, so Ross, I if I share my screen, actually, I can just keep my screen going and maybe you can yeah. tell me when you're ready. Yeah. You I'll, just, I'll just ping you. Sounds great. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, and it's it's fantastic to be uh, working with you all in Washington. I'm excited to be working with Julie uh, and our other folks interested in butterfly conservation. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a quick run through. We did kind of a little bit of a restructure at DFW, you know, with Anne and Mary and Julie and just kind of transitions with species. 
we have done a little bit of shuffling. Um, but I'm going to give you guys just kind of a snapshot of what we're doing uh, on some of these different species, a little bit of a status update. And I'm going to give you guys a few prefaces. I have been in the state for about a month and a half. Distribution maps are very general. Photos, some were pulled from my naturalist with attribution. But if you want to get contentious about whether it has creamy or silvery spots, you can have those arguments, among, um, arguments amongst yourselves. So just a few prefaces here as I go through some of these slides. So looking forward to getting more familiar with these species uh, in Washington. Okay, next slide. There we go. Well, we'll skip that last one. It's it's all good. So that, that was just a list kind of the species. Uh, Julie gave you guys kind of the big list of all the species, uh, the SGCNs that we're working on. This just kind of breaks down the ones that I'm responsible for. Like Julie said, there's a lot more on the west side than there are on the east side. Um, but a lot of these species on the west side are on our SGCN list, and they're kind of prioritized based on their status. So obviously the federally listed, the state listed, and then the SGCN kind of in successive order. Um, but we have tried to break things down geographically um, just so we can kind of focus on an area with specific partners and um, just to really get a lot more familiar on these species. Like it was said, when I worked in Texas, when you have too many species to work on across a giant area, it just makes it very difficult to actually get on the ground conservation um, happening to benefit these species. Next slide. And you can probably jump right through them. I just put a kind of a cover sheet in there. Perfect. So I'm going to start with Oregon silver spot. I figured this one would be really easy because... We don't have any. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, Oregon silver spot uh, was extirpated from the state of Washington uh, over 20 years ago. So it's been quite a while since it was documented in the state uh, historically. And I do have a lot of details in here that I'm sure many of you veterans are, are very familiar with. I add some details in there, one for myself so I can get up to speed. Um, but also if there's new folks who just aren't familiar with the distribution or what these species look like. Um, so this species was historically found along the southwest um, coast of Washington in Pacific and Grays Harbor County, um, really in these coastal dune troughs that are kind of in the, the coastal prairie systems where their host plant, uh, Viola adunca, is present. Um, so that's just kind of a quick snapshot of the historic uh, locations. Next slide, please. Um, there is an Oregon silver spot, or OSB as we call it. We love acronyms in the government. You'll find that very quickly. Um, there is a working group that's been meeting annually since that species uh, was listed uh, to really look at recovery, uh, collaborations across the species range. Um, we met this last spring. It was actually my second day on the job, and I was sent out of state to Oregon on my second day. Um, but we are seeing population declines across the entire species range, uh, unfortunately. So the sites that are in Oregon, they are seeing declines. They're continuing to do a lot of great work on habitat uh, and restoration. Um, the service does have a recovery plan. It's about 20 years old right now. So when they list these species, they write a plan for how do we recover these species? How do we conserve them and bring their populations to back, back to where to a sustainable level? Um, they're actually going to be revising that uh, or updating it here this, this coming year. Uh, the last few times they've updated their internal documents, they've actually proposed to uplist it from threatened to endangered. Uh, and that continues to be their plan. Um, it's sounding like because of these recent declines, there's probably a higher likelihood that it will be uplisted from threatened to endangered. And we are starting to discuss what reintroduction would look like for Washington. Um, once we get habitats ready to go to where we think that it'll accommodate and support uh, the species. Next slide. So here's just a quick picture. Um, this is one site uh, that we call Milepost 6 that's in Pacific County. Uh, it's a WDFW-owned uh, property. It was actually purchased right around the time that the species uh, disappeared from the state. Um, with the intent of managing for this species and other kind of these coastal prairie obligates. Um, so it has been historically mowed. They've tried to thin the conifers because that tends to be one of the, the big threats is this encroachment. We've already heard Julie uh, mention that for a lot of other species, this successional issue just continues to pop up, whether it's natives or invasive species. 
Uh, they also plan to do some burning to try and get some of the thatch or that thick vegetation material that tends to form over time. Um, and they continue to do uh, violet monitoring. So there are violets present. Uh, we want to get them up to a level that we think will help sustain a population. And this would be one of the potential reintroduction sites if we ever get to that point. Um, and we started kind of a Washington uh, OSB meeting just so we can start making plans in the state for how we can get them back out on the landscape. So it'll be super exciting that we can bring a species that hasn't been seen here in 20 years uh, back to the state and hopefully recover it in the long run. Next slide. So here's just a quick uh, example. The, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at uh, Wallapa National Wildlife Refuge has been doing a lot of work, uh, both on the research front to learn what the best way to manage habitat uh, might be. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of issues with succession. So these species starting to stabilize sand dunes, um, which you don't want, you know, open blowing sand dunes all the time because they tend to cover up uh, a lot of the, the host plants that are very small. Uh, but beach grass, which is a non-native, uh, continues to be an issue, as well as uh, conifer encroachment. So you get these forests that as these, these dunes become stabilized, we start to see other larger species start to persist. Um, but they've been doing a fantastic job. You can see from these images here, this is over the last few years, they've actually removed a lot of the beach, beach grass from the areas closest um, to the surf, and then started to remove some of the conifers that have really started to thicken um, those habitats and make it to where there's just, there's no prairie left. Um, so this opens up those habitats and really makes it to where those, those nectar resources, those host plants uh, can start to persist. Next slide. And I will also say, if you saw on that last slide, the genus name, Julie and I had some back and forth on this because at our OSB meeting, there was a very contentious topic about what genus this are the silver spots and some of these fritillaries in. So you'll notice there's a little bit of a discrepancy. I'll just put that extra disclaimer out there. Um, so I'll jump into Taylor's. I kind of, I'm going to touch on what's going on with Taylor's checker spot. I know that there has been a lot of energy uh, focused on the conservation of this species for a few decades now. Um, it is a species that uh, is listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there's been a lot of attention focused on its range in the South Sound. Uh, historically, it's known from the South Sound, the Olympic Peninsula, and also in the San Juans, um, but it's still presumed to be extirpated from the San Juans. So like Island Marble and Anne and others going out there and rediscovering some of these populations, someone wants to go out there on a wild goose chase, see if they can track down Taylor's checker spot out there. It'd be a fa fantastic little side project if someone was interested in uh I really think that a lot of these invertebrates, it really just comes down to search effort. If you get enough time going out there looking, it's that's always the the, the dilemma for many of these species. How have we looked in all the right places? Because some of them can just, they can persist in very small spots. Uh, so this species is really associated with those South Sound uh, prairies, uh, but also with balds. Uh, I was able to get up into Clallam County two weeks ago, and I'll be there actually again tomorrow doing uh, checker spot uh, surveys. Uh, but these just very small, open, very thin soiled habitats surrounded by conifers um, that are again facing um, this issue of uh, conifer encroachment. Um, they feed on uh, castileas. There's a lot of continued debate uh, about which castileas they actually feed on, um, which castilea is the, the species that they prefer, but they also feed on non-native plantain or plantago. Um, there's a lot of evolutionary history with uh, Edith checker spots. Uh, other species that are on the West Coast, their host plant are native plantain. So it's not really a surprise that they would opportunistically feed on something that doesn't naturally occur in their, their native range. Next slide. So I just, I don't tend to like to put lots of words on my slides, um, but just to give you guys a, a snapshot of population trends, this is a frightening slide. When I interviewed for this job, they said, what would you do if the species you were working on just absolutely tanked over the last three years? How would you start to recover it? And my response was, so you mean where it's at now? Um, there's been a precipitous decline in the species over the last few years for uh, a variety of reasons, most of them outside the control of all of us who hope to manage the species and conserve it on the landscape. Um, this is also just the data from the South Sound that tends to be where we have the more robust long-term data sets for a wide variety of sites. Um, next slide, please. 
And just to give you a snapshot, so what happened uh, a few years ago was we went from a situation where we had robust host plants on the landscape at many of these sites where Taylor's checker spot were found, Taylor's were seeing a very large increase in their populations, and we had some abnormally uh, extreme weather events, extreme heat, very low precipitation, and the combination of those two factors led to the decline of host plant availability on the landscape. So you can see from the left side of those images to the right side, those are two of the, the host plants. The top two images are plantain and the bottom two are castilea at the same sites. And those were grids that we, we actually go out and do habitat assessments of host plants and general nectar resources um, at these sites. And this was done by Mary Linders and um, Andy DeShane and some of the team here at DFW, as well as our partners um, at EcoStudies. But there was a precipitous decline in host plants. And obviously we can't grow caterpillars if they don't have any groceries. So unfortunately that's what happened with the species and we're kind of slowly working our way out of that hole. Um, this year is looking really great. Um, next slide. So captive rearing. So this year is looking really good. We've been captive rearing butterflies uh, since 2007. And this graph just kind of shows you the cumulative number of individuals that we have released at all of those sites in the South Sound. Um, what is not listed there is Clallam County. So the Olympic Peninsula, Peninsula population did have to have uh, a number of individuals taken into captivity because the population dropped so low, we were very worried it wasn't gonna pull itself out. Um, so we did have a captive reared population that was reintroduced this last year, and numbers are actually looking very good, of both the wild individuals and those that were released. Um, so this just, just to give you a snapshot of how we managed for this species, Julie also mentioned, um, you know, the same is occurring for island marble. Um, we're hoping to kick off an enclosure study, which is basically, you know, putting up a, a tent. If any of you guys have been out to Scatter Creek who are in the South Sound and you see those tents popping up, uh, you know, it's enclosure season. Um, so we are hoping to do that just to get a better understanding of what survival actually looks like when we put these individuals out onto the prairie. Um, and then to get a better understanding of where they have better survival. So are we putting them in the right places? What, how can we maximize uh, survival when we are putting these actively reared individuals out in the landscape? Um, we're also trying to dig. I mentioned there's a little bit of a controversy in the Castilea community, the, the, the paintbrush community, because there's two species that tend to occur in these areas. One was just delisted. Uh, it was a delisted plant, ca uh, Castilea levisecta, and the other is Castilea hispida. Um, there's a lot of contention about, you know, whether these are two separate species. They hybridize very easily. Um, they're, they, let's just say the paintbrushes get around. Uh, there's a lot of evolutionary history there where they've ebbed and flowed because of glacial movement and they've, they're, they're very messy uh, taxonomically. Um, so that's just kind of a quick snapshot of kind of what we're doing on the Taylor's front. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh. There we go. Okay, so like uh, Oregon Silver Spot, there is a draft recovery plan update coming probably in the next year. I think the Fish and Wildlife Service told us they're hoping to have that finalized by September, um, which will help us really quantify how we can recover the species. Where do we think we need to get to for this species to be stable? Uh, and it's across its range. It's not just Washington, but it also includes Oregon. Um, what we're hoping to do, like I said, a lot of the focus on this species has been in the South Sound. Um, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of great partnerships uh, in the South Sound. Uh, what we're hoping to do is spend a little more time in the Olympic Peninsula and the San Juan Islands to better understand habitat. Um, so what habitat's available, where are species located? I know Ann Potter, um, a lot of folks uh, like Karen Holtrip, a lot of folks have spent time on the national forests, in the national parks, on the peninsula, looking to see where the species occurs. And I'd like to spend a lot more time and energy uh, focused on uh, the Olympic Peninsula because there is so much momentum and so much happening in the South Sounds. I don't want to discount uh, the other places where the species occurs. Next slide, please. And I don't know how many of you know Mary Linders. Uh, Mary Linders' last day with DFW, she retired. Her last day was actually yesterday. Um, I've had the privilege over the last six weeks of being able to shadow her and absorb a lot of her uh, incredible knowledge uh, in her 20 years of managing this species. Um, she's, I just had to give her a shout out because I think she's been a 
super important uh, leader in this, uh, this field. Uh, she's the one who really got a lot of the captive rearing work and the relocation work established. Um, what was, what we need to do for habitat restoration, basically that I'm standing on her shoulders in this new role. And I feel um, we need to acknowledge a lot of the work that she's done uh, during her tenure. Uh, so just wanted to give her a shout out as well. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna go super quick through some of these other species because I know we have limited time uh, and would love to chat with you all more. Um, so just to give you a snapshot of what we're doing for this species, there is about a 10 year history of surveying for this and several other SGCNs in the South Sound. Uh, and Potter kicked a lot of those off. Um, a lot of you probably also know uh, Brad who's kind of been working on monitoring these species for the last 10 years. Um, but we're hoping to expand some of that work to start understanding what's happening with the species elsewhere that maybe hasn't had as much love. Next slide, please. Perfect. No, you can go to the next one. That's great. Just a header. Great. So here's the four uh, skipper species, just some very general areas where these species are found. Um, we also have a couple that you'll notice where we have some of these distinct uh, population segments. I'm really looking forward to picking John's brain on how to define these things and how to better understand what's going on with some of these species that um, have some taxonomic context, context, because I know there's a lot of history with some of these species, but also kind of how we define um, distribution. So we better know where uh, to manage these species. So just a quick snapshot of what's going on with these. Next slide. Uh, Julie already covered Mardon Skipper, um, the genetic work that's being done. Uh, there's also population monitoring happening in multiple places in the state with a lot of our partners. Um, and I'm going to give a shout out to Julie and her uh, collaborators, Derek and Anne. Next, one click. And there, there's the periodic status review that Julie spent so much time on. Um, just a huge shout out to her for finishing that off right before I came on board and took the species over. So it's a huge lift uh, leading into work that I hope to be doing on the species. And I also wanted to give a shout out to you all. Uh, Julie mentioned the commission. Um, when she presents to the commission, like most people think that they're the ones who set, you know, elk harvests or what the salmon seasons are going to look like. Their responsibility is to manage all of the species in the state of Washington. And having people from this community and other folks who are interested in butterfly and insect conservation vocalize their support for that work at places like the commission meetings goes a long way. Because when they hear from those members of the constituency, because they, I, Julie, we work for you guys. We work for the people of the state of Washington. So when they hear from you all about what you think is important, it goes a long way. So just wanted to throw that in there since Julie did such a great job on that presentation. Next slide. Okay, Sonora Skipper, um, very similar to what we've heard on some of these others. We're hoping we can kind of pick more information up when we're doing the Mardon work in the South Cascades. Um, and we're also continuing to do monitoring. Uh, Brad's done a fantastic job getting out to a lot of these historic sites in the South Sound. Um, but again, we'd like to expand. We'd like to know, uh, and seeing those dots on the map that Julie showed that Sarah had populated for her is exciting. We're getting more dots on maps to try and tell us where these species occur. Next slide. Same with these uh, two species. Uh, the Propertius are out and about. I heard a few folks say that they were seeing them last week. Uh, we've been out on the landscape the last two weeks and have not seen any yet. Uh, lots of host plants, lots of suitable habitat, but just they haven't seemed to pop out yet, at least to where we've been able to detect them. But we're hoping to continue historic efforts and just continue into the future. Next slide. Okay, we'll skip this one. General distribution of these four Gossamer wing species, a couple quick pictures, and there's the shout out. If you hadn't found it yet, Koji, that's that's your picture that I found off your iNaturalist observation. Beautiful images, mm -hmm. as usual. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So with those those species, just like a lot of the other SGCNs, that kind of they're not, um, you know, state listed. They're not federally listed. There's been a lot of work that's happened in the South Sound, South Cascades. You can kind of see on the map that Julie showed you, there's a lot of areas where we have a lot of effort. There's been a lot of work that's been done uh, historically. We really want to try and support work to expand 
beyond those areas where we typically go. Um, I've worked with a lot of people in the tiger beetle community, and I know they can be kind of like butterfly collectors. We're like, I know I can see X at this place, and we love to go back to the same places. I have done it for years, but trying to find out more about where they are that we just don't have any understanding. Um, and the lack of data, Julie kind of mentioned this, and I, I know that we'll get to it here uh, when Regina speaks as well, is it's, it's it's a struggle for us as people who are trying to manage and conserve these species. The lack of data is very difficult. Um, butterflies are not like black-tailed deer or elk. They, they're just not lots of observations of where these species occur on the landscape. Um, so really the need for data, the need uh, for comprehensive data is super important. And what I wanted to speak on was um, status assessments. So um, we kind of use the conservation community kind of uses what we call conservation status assessments to try and help start us down the path of which species are priorities, which ones are vulnerable. Um, and they do that usually through NatureServe or through the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, have kind of two methods for determining vulnerability. Uh, and what we would like to do is update those assessments so we have a better picture of which species are vul vulnerable in the state of Washington. This is happening. Uh, nationwide through the State of the Butterflies project um, that several partners, uh, especially in the West, are actually um, pursuing. What we'd like to do is get these things updated at the state level. Uh, and I imagine that that process is probably going to involve a lot of you, especially those of you who have, have data, have understandings of life history, threats that you see when you're out there as far as that changing landscape. I know John mentioned before we started the meeting that you know a lot of places he went to, they're very different now. Um, what do those things look like? Why do we think that the, the, the numbers are declining? Because we want to get these updated. A lot of these species you'll notice in this little slide right here. And if you hit next, Julie, it'll show you guys. Actually, I think it might get. There we go. Um, a lot of these species have not been updated in sometimes decades. So we really need to get a snapshot of what their current status is. Um, that Those updated ranks um, will also feed into our species of greatest conservation need list. So there's a lot of species that probably should be on that list, but they're not because we just don't know anything about them currently. Um, like, I find it interesting that we don't have metal marks. There's a lot of conservation priority metal marks in the West, and there aren't any on our list, but there's a couple that technically meet the criteria. Same with a lot of these others you can see on the list that just have not been on our radar. So we're really hoping if we have the data to try and feed into some of this work, that's really hoping where we're hoping to get in the not too distant future. So that's all I have. I think that's my last slide, Julie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ross. That was, that was, that was so great. That was great. Um, this is our last slide. And then um, I think, um, Paulette, maybe we could take a couple questions. And I don't know, do you guys take a break or... How do the how do the sessions work for you guys? Oh, we're gonna keep on going. We just had a, a couple of um, comments, a comment from Karen uh, saying that she's looking forward to seeing you all at the ONF sites. And there was some discussion about the um, JBLM gear and uh, why why you needed to wear that. And uh, Regina filled us in on that, but it's an army base and an artillery range. So I think I think we're good to keep on going. Okay, well, great. I think, you know, just to touch off what Ross was just talking about, what I mentioned earlier about our data gaps. And we really want to fill in the blanks and learn more about distribution and abundance of Washington State butterflies so that can feed into our new updates and assessments um, that are going to be occurring in the next six months. Uh, as I mentioned, our 2025 swap is, is coming up quick. So um, this has inspired us to come to you tonight to really um, talk about how important it is to submit your observations to, to support statewide distribution, unique species and habitat, and especially uh, our SGCN species and other rare and declining species. Um, when I'm going to walk you through the the reporting app right now for the at risk um, species, um, we're going to be really advocating and recommending that if you see a species on that 21 on those 21 species that I showed you earlier, 
to use the at-risk reporting app, and then all butterflies to the iNaturalist. Um, so let's, let me see. Okay, before you go on, and there's a question about the northern range of the Martin Skipper. What it, is the northern range? So the Cascade, it's the Cascade Mountains. Can you see my, can you see my? Yes. So right around here, the northern range is, so we'll, it's in the Cascade Range. I should have put my Mardon Skipper map there. Um, but uh, Gifford Pinchot uh, National Forest, um, Conrad Meadows, many of you may have visited that. Um, um, so there's populations just north of that area. Um, yeah, any other questions? No, let's uh let's go. John, on. do you know the northernmost point or Bob Pyle? Do you know the northernmost point of the Mardon Skipper? Well, uh, I think they, so they don't really occur north of the uh, White Pass Highway in Yakima County, and they really don't occur north of Thurston County on the east west of the Cascades. Yeah, I think you're right about Conrad Meadows and about Tenino, a little yeah. bit north of there. And there's also a question about the 21 um, uh, species um, and whether we could have a, a list of them. And that may be part of your presentation. Yeah, yes. The, um, I was going to go back to the first part, but I guess it's. And I can post the link. Yeah, it's on the first slide. Um, but I am trying to get the, I'm trying to move my screen here so I can show you the screen. Okay. I'm still showing my screen. You can see yeah, this. Sure. Yep. Okay. So this was the biodiversity grant funding, but I am going to move over to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife report wildlife observations. And if you just Google WDFW report wildlife, this will come up. Ross is going to just put it in the chat for you there very simple to find. And now I just want to walk you through. So you're in the field. And I know that you're taking two field trips to look for monarchs and one to look for golden hair streaks soon. I, I peeked at your list and I really would love to join all of them. And I'm trying to make time to at least um, make one or two. But those are two that stood out to me because I thought, wow, this is a perfect opportunity for WBA members to use the at-risk reporting if they see those species. And so what you do is you just click on uh, the observation link and this little survey one, two, three form will come up. And it'll say report at risk wildlife observations to WDFW. And I wanna reiterate this process is like, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's a direct connection to Ross and I. Like, <laughs> uh, it will go to Sarah first, who's our data biologist. Um, she usually gets a batch of these on a weekly basis. If any butterflies come in, she'll look on the list and she'll say, which one's Ross, which one's Julie? And she'll send it to us to, for verification um, from the photograph. And then as soon as we verified it, that uh, data point will go immediately into our state database and we can use that information. Um, immediately. And I, I mentioned John's batch data, but I also want to put a shout out to um, Tana Canoose. Did I say her name, last name right? Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> so last year we had uh, Tana um, uh, put in a uh, sighting of Sonora Skipper in Pierce County, Lowland per Pierce County, um, last year. And that was a, a new lowland record for the state. Um, and the habitat itself was also fairly unique from the only other place we see it in the South Puget Sound, which is West Rocky Prairie. West Rocky Prairie has these wet deposit areas, wetter areas within the drier, um, short statured grasses, fescue community. Um, but they have these seepages where there's carricks, which is where at West Rocky, you're gonna find the two hot spots of Sonora Skipper. Well, Tana, use this reporting form. I got the information. I was extremely excited. It was a new data point. And that observation led to funding, um, a funding opportunity for a nonprofit organization 
um, that we funded to go out there and do additional surveys and also do a, a habitat assessment to describe that plant community. So we could actually learn from what are the needs of this species uh, to help us understand you know, how to move forward with our restoration efforts. Um, so this at risk, Tana used it. Um, so she just pulled it up and it says about the animal, you go and select your animal group and I'll go down to invertebrates. Click on invertebrates. Uh, I click on the subgroup, which is flies, butterflies, and bees group. And then you select the animal. These are common names. Um, so you go to your common name. Uh, let's just say Johnson's hair streak. Uh, okay. And then how did you detect the animal? I visually saw it. That's, that's, the, that's the choice uh, you will, uh, you'll all select, visually saw it. What is the status of the animal you're reporting on? Uh, it's alive, hopefully. And then there's a place to count what, how many, how many butterflies you've seen. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, you're out there at Crab Creek looking at monarchs or David James. And at the end of the day, maybe someone's like, oh, what's the total count? Oh, we saw 30 monarch butterflies. So I would put my 30 count there. Um, my accuracy would either be approximate or exact. And then you can select details if you know them, the sex of the animal, the life stage, uh, and so forth. So there's these additional fields that aren't required. The most important ones are the first ones I just went through and showed you, but there are more details uh, in the form. There's also a notes field that you can tell us something about the habitat uh, or threats or stressors you might be noticing at the site. Uh, and then the next one, uh, oh, I have to put a count in here before I can go next. And then you follow this through. There's five different pages. This is the page that helps you with the locality. So um, you can zoom into the exact place. You can change the layer to look at the imagery. So to give you a better idea of where you're at, um, you can zoom in and put that point exactly where you're at. Now I wanna take this moment to say, if you're in the field and you don't have, let's say you don't have internet access. So what I would recommend at that point is taking photos of the butterfly. So you have that photographic verification, which is a key part of this. Um, unless somebody like Joan Pelham uh, or Robert Michael Pyle are um, submitting a survey, I might not know who you are. I might not know your level um, of identification skills. Uh, and so I wouldn't be able to readily verify it um, without an image. Um, so images are really important. Um, but the point here is, if you don't have access, you can go back to this. You can take all the data in the field and then go back to this form later um, and enter it. And again, it's uh, you can select how accurate your location is, notes, and uh, next. And then let's see, I wanted to, why isn't it letting me? There's that. Oh, I have to select a location. Okay, select the location. There's a dummy location. Next. Um, so once you have selected what the butterfly is, how many butterflies there are, you've selected your location, then the date and observers. What date did you um, observe it? Your name, last name, email, that sort of thing. And then uh, the, the final slide is where your photos uh, can be dropped in, or you can take a photo right there, or if you have them stored on your phone, you can upload them. Uh, and that's the last, that's the last page. Um, and then you submit your observation. So it's, it's fairly straightforward uh, and um, easy to use, I think. Um, so I really encourage, Ross and I would love to see some of those SGCN butterfly species come in through this app this season. Um, 
So I want to take a moment there and stop and see if there are any questions uh, with. Yeah, there, there are some questions and I think we'll have some discussion, but I want to make sure that Regina has time to, to talk about um, iNaturalist. So there's, there's uh, you know, the idea is to get the observations pushed um, to people who can use them as soon as possible. And your app is, is one thing, but iNaturalist is another one. So yours is very specific to those 21 species of, of greatest interest. And then um, Regina is going to talk about um, uh, the, the rest of the species. So, yeah. and then we'll have a discussion afterwards about um, the generalities. So uh, Regina, can you share your screen? Paulette, can you, am I still sharing? You are sharing, so you'll have to unshare. Okay, can you, let's see. Uh, not signing. Go back to share. Do you want me to? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Got it. Regina, are you ready to? Okay. Yes. Let me share my screen now. Um, oh, goodness. It's updated. We were just talking about how you never know what Zoom is going to do. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I've, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> Um, I see the iNaturalist up there. Yeah, I'm trying. I've got two different screens of iNaturalist, and of course the Zoom screen is covering part of it. So what I wanted to show people first is this is my iNaturalist homepage, my observations. It says I have 420 observations of 278 species. And I just do all kinds of stuff. I would not at all call myself a super user for iNaturalist. Um, I use it when I need to or when I wanna try to impress people. You can see I do a lot of mushrooms, but I will say there are some taxa that iNaturalist is good at identifying and some that it is not good at identifying. Mushrooms, it is not good. <laughs> um, butterflies, it is decent. It has always nailed the Western toad. Every time I put it up, it has nailed it. So <laughs> that's good. But what I'm gonna show you is I have under community, you will get projects and I have joined a bunch of projects, and this is the Washington Butterflies project here. And it starts you out with the overview of some statistics, uh, the different, the most recent observations that have been put up. And what this project is doing is every observation of a butterfly or selected moths, ones that I got to pick, um, will be put in this project. You do not have to put your observations in the project, which is true of some projects, but not this one. See, there's David James. He has the most observations and the most species for our project at this point in time. It was actually Swiss chick, whoever that is, for some time. Um, but David James has overtaken her. Here's all of the different families that will be in this project. These are different moths that I thought were worth looking at. It's mostly day flying moths. And then all of the butterflies, super family of Papillionoidea. So, and if you're in Washington state and you have an observation of any of these taxa, and there is a photo, I do require that you have a photo, it will go in this project automatically. And what's fun is that here's all the observations in a grid format. And you might notice some of them have this little RG in the corner. That means research grade, which means that somebody has verified the identification of that, that um, critter. So this person put up a photo that he said was the ranchman's tiger moth, this little caterpillar here. And somebody else came along and agreed with him. You just click the agree button if you want to agree with someone. Now it is 
research grade. So when John Pelham comes along and downloads data for his maps, this thing is a candidate if he's collecting ranchman's tiger moth observations. And what else can we show you here? Um, these are all research grade. Here's a uh, Propertius dusky wing that is not yet research grade. So it says needs ID. This one has not, oh, that's my coworker, Carlo. He was gonna, we saw that on Sunday when we were leading a native plant society hike on um, uh, up at um, White Salmon, White Salmon Oaks Natural Area. I told him, put that on iNaturalist. He said, but I don't have an account. So now he has an account. Cool, this is great. So, Propertius dusky wing. I don't know if when he put it up, iNaturalist suggested that or if he told iNaturalist that that's what it is. Probably iNaturalist suggested it and he knew that was the right thing. So since I am signed in as myself, I can verify that ID. Watch this, this is so fun. Agree, that's all you have to do. And now it is research grade. So that's really cool. He took this photo with his smartphone. So it automatically has the date and the GPS location. When you update that to iNaturalist, it will put the dot on the map for you. Um, hopefully your phone is right. My phone is often wrong. There's a way to move it if your phone is wrong. My phone has been as much as a county off. <laughs> um, I always have to check it. <laughs> well, I prioritized getting a phone that was indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the GPS is not so good and it does not take good photos of butterflies anyway. So there is that. Mm -hmm. So you may be asking, some of you may not have a iNaturalist account and you don't really know where to get started. So I have... This screen here, which is a brand new account that I just made last night for this purpose. And it tells you a little bit about what to do to get started. Just go outside and take a picture, basically. Um, yeah, it still doesn't like my email, but too bad. So uh, let's see, I have somewhere, nope, not there. There is help on this site and it will go through and tell you exactly what you need to do to get started posting observations and what the process is of verifying identifications. So you're going to make a photo and hopefully you're using a camera that has GPS and a date stamp. Um, my best camera does not do GPS, so that's kind of annoying. You have to enter the, the location yourself, kind of like what Julie was showing with their observations app on their website. So it'll go through step by step what you need to do to make an observation. Here's instructions for an Android. Here's instructions for an iPhone. It's very simple. Um, Basically, you just click on make, you know, add an observation, upload a photo, and then it will suggest what it thinks it is. Do not believe it necessarily. You want to make sure that your photos show the identifying characteristics of whatever critter it is um, so that other people can say, yes, that's what that is. It will suggest, and you can accept its suggestion, or you can type in a different name and pull up the name, and we'll go through all that. It should add the location and date automatically, and then you hit save, and then it goes up to the community, and you get a little thing that says you posted that. So you do not have to add these observations, but let's show how to, let's get rid of all this stuff. So I have some photos here and some of them have GPS and some don't, and we will go through adding them to iNaturalist. So there's a button here that says upload 
and you just click on that. It says drag or drop. Now, when you're entering from the website, you can only do one photo at a time and then you upload that observation and then you can add more photos. If you're adding, creating the observation from your smartphone, you can add photos as you want. You don't need to wait to add them. So let's move this over and we will take this photo and we will drop it. And now what it's gonna do is it's gonna think about it. And it probably has no idea what it is because it's a male and a female great spangled fritillary and they look totally different. But look at this, it does actually know what they are, even though it's a crappy photo. So we will go great spangled fritillary and it puts in the date automatically. It doesn't have the location because this is my phone that doesn't have a GPS. So you click on that and you get a map. Skinetta Creek Wildlife Area. And then it will have like this great big, you can move it around and move your dot and you can arrange the um, accuracy there. And then it, see, it puts all this in, accuracy, 725 meters. Geo privacy is normally open. You can change that for something if you don't want the general public to see where it is, but people like John should be able to see that. So now we will update observation. Now it has a location. You can put in any notes that you want. And then submit. And it takes it a little while and it thinks about it and it puts it up. And there it is. Now, if I wanted to add more photos, that's just the map of all of my observations on iNaturalist. It's mostly Washington, as you can see. If, you, if I wanted to add more photos, I would just go back to the observation and hit this little plus button. And then I could add more photos. If you're doing it on your phone, you can add a bunch of photos all at once. It's just on the website. You can only do one at a time. If you drop more than one photo in, it thinks you're making a bunch of separate observations. So now we've got that. Needs ID. So we're going to wait for somebody to come along and say that, oh, yes, it is that. Let's try one of the others that should have the location already. How about this guy? Let's see if it knows what that is. It's got the genus, that's good. And it's just a caterpillar, so that's that's pretty smart. Um, let's see, so we don't need to do anything else here. We'll just put that up the way it is. That was not in Washington, so it will not get picked up by our WBA Washington State Butterflies Project. In fact, I probably already posted this photo, but um, we can go to this observation. And I don't know off the top of my head exactly what species that is, but it's just up as the genus. If somebody else came along and they know what species that is, they could come down here and suggest an identification and put in a species name. And you can actually add notes as to why you think it's that. We don't need to do that right now. You can also come in and you can disagree with somebody's identification if you think they're wrong. What I do see a lot of on iNaturalist is people are way more confident of what they've got than they really ought to be. They don't have the characteristics that you need visible in the photo. Um, I see a lot of, especially with the mushrooms, people trying to make something be something rare or something that doesn't even occur here because they don't want it to be the common thing that is all over the place. So you can actually disagree with people's observations, but what I also see is what happens sometimes 
is that you're looking at an observation and people have gone back and forth about exactly, and they've gotten it to a subspecies, maybe even, or a variety or something really, really precise. And then somebody else comes along and says, I have no idea what they're talking about. That's a plant and that's all I know. And so they put plant and they ruin all that work everybody put into identifying something exactly. Um, that makes people mad. So do not be that person, please. Um, okay, let's look at, come back here, Washington State Butterfly Project. So, um, it hasn't been picked up yet. It should be in here. Let's look at the observations grid. Yeah, my, um, so the one I just posted has not shown up yet, but it could at any time. Now, what could happen if you're looking at this, you would have an opportunity to agree if that's what you think that is. Um, ooh, endangered, see, it's showing that it's endangered. So that's nice. Uh, that is probably somewhere at Fort Lewis. It doesn't show the exact location for things that it agrees are endangered. Let's pick something like this guy. That's obvious what that is. We could come in and we can agree again. And that just gives it another, makes it even stronger. Now, iNaturalist lets pretty much anybody who has a user account agree or disagree with an um, identification. So you do want to make sure you give the reasons why you think something is or is not what it is, and you want to make sure your photo shows what people need to see. And what Julie and Ross are going to be looking at is they're going to be verifying these observations as best they can when they come in, because as I said, it could be any five-year-old that came in and said, agree. And I think there are people who do that. They just go through and agree with a bunch of things that you couldn't really tell from the photo if that's what it was or not. Um, let's just look at this guy again. Research grade. So let's see. Anyway, so, and that there's a couple of projects this guy's doing. Here's all the top identifiers of that genus. Um, oh, there's our, there's our friend Stuart. Stuart is a member and I'm hoping that Stuart will, oh, and there's Meryl Peterson, hoping that they will be watching this project. So what you do, if you want to join a project is you come back here and let's go to the top and let's go um, community, you go community, projects, and we search Washington butterflies, Washington state butterflies. You notice there's butterflies of the Washington area. That's Washington, DC. We don't want that. Um, this is Washington State. So now you've gone there and you should have a join this project button somewhere. And maybe I did that already. But if you join the project, then it shows up here in your projects list, which this is not doing. So let's go back. And what I want people to do, like Stuart and John Bauman and John Pelham and all you other people who really know your butterflies, is that you will come and you will verify some of these observations. And the easiest way to do that is to join the project and then it shows up in your list here. Like if we look at my personal one, it's in the list as well as a bunch of other projects. So Regina, we have a couple of comments and questions. Are, are you? Uh, yeah. uh, I have questions. Um, so there was a, uh, Chris, uh, do you want to unmute or do you want me to ask your question about cropping photos?
So I'll go ahead and start and Chris can, can chime in. He's asking, is it best to crop an image before uploading it to decrease the size and hasten loading or does it matter? It doesn't matter. They're not gonna upload the entire 50 gazillion megabytes or whatever it is, but you can actually crop it once you've uploaded it to bring, if your photo is, if your object is kind of small in the photo, you can zoom in on it. And that will help if the focus is good. That will help people to verify your observation if you zoom in on it when you post it. Okay, and then uh, David Jennings pointed out that sometimes GPS is a little slow to catch up and sometimes you need to uh, give it a minute. David, do you wanna comment on that? Is for the B Atlas using iNatural says you actually let your phone stay on for 15 seconds or more. And during that time, the phone will pick up more satellites. And so you can, if you have a little tool for it, which you can find for free, is you can see your GPS location and get more and more precise down to, you know, seven meters or something before it's about as good as it'll get on a phone. But if you first start, it might be 150 meters. Just give it a few seconds and it'll get a lot more precise. Yeah, yeah, I have seen that with my um, pocket camera, which is the one I use most for mushrooms because it has focus stacking. It can take it a while for the GPS to catch up. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't pull a signal in, it will just put on the GPS point of the last one that you took. So you can take a whole bunch of photos that are not in the same place and have them on the same GPS. Boy, I do not know what the deal is with my camera's GPS. Some days it has gone entire days without taking a single point at all. Um, and then other times it'll be way off. And then other times it's fine. I don't know. I think it must be possessed or something. Okay, so uh, I naturally, there was also um, a question about the um, um, RG, the research grade and Ross answered that. Do you wanna, um, just amplify your uh, answer, Ross, about conflicting opinions about research grade. Yeah, it's kind of a balance. Um, so if, if no one else puts an identification or you can test on a contradict your identification that you put on iNaturalist, it'll kind of break and get two agreeing opinions on that. We're having trouble understanding you. Um, so yeah, I don't I can't hear your sound quality is impaired. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a balance there. Okay, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read your answer because we're having trouble understanding you. So, um, as to um, the research grade is, is um, indicated if there's an agreement. But if there's conflicting opinions, either the, the first um, opinion needs to retract their ID or other people need to keep weighing in. So there, there is a correction. It's a, you know, it's a crowdsourcing thing. Um, you know, there's a, a little bit of a, a delay in a process to get it corrected. So, yeah, I've had observations where I put the wrong thing first and then like someone will come along and, and say different names, and then there'll actually be a DNA sequence done, and that gets posted. We have a project for the fungi up the South Sound where somebody will actually post the DNA sequence on iNaturalist and correct the, um, the name, the species name, but then I have to go back and agree on that for that to take. Yeah. If I can show you that here, we'll go to the South Sound Fungal Diversity. Or actually, let's just go to mine because I had some fungi up here. Um, oh, there's my, um, who got, oh, this one got DNA sequenced. And so I first put it down as Cortinarius colonitis. And after it was sequenced and the sequence actually got put in right there. All this stuff here is the DNA sequence from that specimen. And so it's actually an undescribed species. Mm -hmm. So it got put down as section, uh, whatever, defibulati. And it 
stayed at not research grade until I came along and accepted that identification. And now that's what it says. I mean, it can't be research grade because we don't know a species, but it's an undescribed species. So somebody has to write up a species description now. It's going to be Cordinaria Johnsonii. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you never know. Of course, they might be referring to a completely different Johnson when they do that. <laughs> then Regina Ensis, or Regina, <laughs> Regina I. <laughs> Regina I, that's it. Regina I. Isn't that a pretty one? Yeah. It is beautiful, yeah. So um, I know that uh, John has been working very closely with um, Julie and Ross. And so, um, John, could you weigh in a little bit about um, what Julie and Ross are doing and the value of iNaturalist to you? Because these are these are separate um, data entry um, systems. And so I just want to hear from you since you're pu putting so much of these data together. Well, first of all, I just met Ross tonight. I've heard about him and I'm looking forward to, you know, whatever's coming next. Uh, second of all, uh, thanks to Regina for um, en enlightening me on how to download, batch download from my naturalist. I've been downloading like crazy from my naturalist. And I think it's one of the best things that's ever come along. Um, the only downside to iNaturalist, and it's kind of trivial and I'm just pouting, I guess, is you can't dissect a photograph and you can't turn it over, you know, but that's like pretty, um, you know, pretty feeble. And I'm amazed that the AI is doing as well as it, as it, you know, has been doing. It's just, it's just like Regina said, you know, it doesn't take long and the AI will nail it. And my buddy, um, Andy Warren in Colorado went out last weekend and there was a beetle flying around. He had no idea what it was. And his uh, his buddy took a picture of it, put it on that on a naturalist. And in less than uh, 20 seconds, they had a, an identification to species that was accurate. So that's pretty astounding. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, recommend that what Ross said earlier is definitely so. People need to go where other people haven't. Now, in Western Washington, sometimes we have a reason not to go where other people have it because you're in a music forest and butterflies don't really, you know, like it in dank, you know, damp conditions. They, you know, get moldy. So, but in, in the case of like the San Juan Islands, I would think that that's a really important thing to recognize that uh, like Taylor's checker spot could be right at the strand line along the beach. I mean, it is a butterfly that we have found in those situations um, um, in, in, in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And of course, the Juan de Fuca blue is in a, uh, you know, basically a salt spray um, desert of, on a spit. So, you know, you have to sometimes go where you haven't gone before, you know, like Star Trek. So, uh, you know, I really definitely uh, like that. As to our cooperative venture, this has been an amazing adventure uh, for me. Um, it's overwhelming because I get thousands. I just got a database, uh, you know, doc file, database of, of Pontia Occidentalis done. It's, it's like 1,500 records for our state. And in, you know, compiling those records, you know, you learn a lot. Well, okay, Occidentalis isn't a butterfly that's going to be of concern, but it is interesting, you know, from a scientific point of view. And it reflects, you know, the, the kinds of things that you can learn by examining, you know, some other, uh, you know, species of pyres that are less so. You can contrast it with um, Euchloe osonides and Salanda. I mean, that's a butterfly that's widespread east of the Cascades, and here it is out there in the islands, and, and it almost doesn't make sense as to how that happened. But you know that people like me want to go there. And I'm sure that between um, now and the end of the year, Ross and Julie and I are going to have some wonderful conversations. I'm I'm out. You got it. Okay. Well, thank you, John, for letting us uh, have your perspective on um, what's valuable about about these apps. Uh, Bob, did you have some things to say too? And I, I, we'll open it up for open discussion. I just wanted to to get a, a few of our experts, um, you know, commenting on the value of of these apps uh, to them. Julie and Ross have explained. Um, but I was hoping to hear from some of our other experts in WBA. So, Bob, can you? Um, the floor is yours. Please uh, finish your discussion of the apps first, and then come back to me. Okay. It's uh, do we do we have some other uh, things that we need to talk about with the apps? Um, I think uh, Melanie was asking about um, batch downloading. Do you wanna um, 
Do you want to uh, comment on that, Melanie? Okay. Well, Ross just um, responded to my comment. Okay. I just given that there's only one uh, one agreement in order to make it research grade, and a five year old could go down and agree. It seems like if you batch download. Um, that's a lot of work still to go through and look at each of those pictures to confirm. Is that what still needs to be done? I guess that's what I was asking. I don't know who wants to answer that. Ross already commented. John, did you did you follow that? Yeah, okay. So uh, I can tell you that I'm over the top. I don't really do a lot of corrections because if um, if I do, you know, I mean, I'm a stinky guy, you know, like I get Caitlin or Farrell Merrill. You know, I love that name, by the way, Farrell Merrill, you know, Merrill Peterson. I'll think, I will notify them that they need to look at these, um, you know, these you know, pictures to to identify them. And, and those guys got a little bit of a rep and I think things will work out pretty well. I look at every image that I'm putting into the database. And if I can't tell what it is and Merrill or Caitlin can't tell what it is, then we can't tell what it is. I mean, dorsal images of a fritillary can be pretty challenging, especially from some places where there's, you know, four or five species. So that's just the way it goes. I mean, that's true in the museum too. Honestly, there's, you know, there's, you know, museum specimens that people can't agree on identifications, and that's just the way it goes. Thank Not you. everything is going to be identifiable from a photo on iNaturalist. I mean, one of the statistics I heard recently was that with fungi in particular, iNaturalist cannot reliably identify the death cap fungus, which that's kind of scary. So you want to remember that when you're looking at your butterfly observations on here, it does pretty well with butterflies. Now, you'll also notice, I mean, I know Bob has talked about this before, but you can have like a pseudonym. You can sign up as with a pseudonym as your username, which a lot of people do, I mean, most of these, but some of them is your real name. But even so, if you go and look at this, usually people will tell you exactly who they are. Um, they'll have a real name in here. Uh, maybe David James doesn't, but I know I do. So I know that John has talked about how he knows who these people are and he knows their reputation and he knows if he can trust their uh, their um, identifications or not. So you do, it is a community. You do get to know names and you know who people are. Yeah, also, like if you're eating mushrooms uh, you know, that a mycologist has embedded for you, you deserve anything that happens to you. Well, yeah, what we tell people is you can eat any mushroom once and that's it. <laughs> but, um, when we started with our fungal project on iNaturalist, I swear half of my submissions iNaturalist thought was a frog. So <laughs> <laughs> just keep that in mind. <laughs> Some things are going to be very difficult. Birds are easy, wildflowers are easy, er, butterflies, it's reasonable. Reptiles, apparently it does really well with reptiles because people post a lot of photos of reptiles and lots of people go in and correct the ident identifications. So it's artificial intelligence basically and it learns as we post stuff. And if you don't post much of some particular taxon, it's not gonna be very good at that. Um, so, and things that have to be distinguished by dissection or by DNA sequencing, uh, no photo is ever going to be able to pin that down exactly. Okay, are there any other uh, comments about the apps? Um, anything? But I would really encourage those of you who are good with your butterflies to regularly take a look at what's been posted to the project and go through and verify identifications. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, hey, I'm... Julie, Julie, Julie. Yep. John, uh, John. <laughs> I got to tell you, man, you guys did great. Um, I'm really, you know, like enthusiastic about the fact that we have somebody uh, from the state that is participating in our community or we are participating with the state. It is a collegial association. And I'm so grateful that we have that opportunity. And thank you. And Ross, good to meet you, bro. And I would second both of those observations. 
both of those emotions. I second that emotion. <laughs> Julie, dear, it's great to see you and Ross. Great to meet you. And uh, stunning, stunning presentation by both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Kevin Burles of Xerxes, what a treat to have you here. Um, you can imagine how thrilled I am to see this action, to see all this going on, and to see uh, to see the flowering of butterfly conservation this day and age. Uh, it's it's really, really exciting for me. You can also imagine that I might have a lot of comments, <laughs> but I'm not going to make very many. I'd like to make four brief comments uh, and uh, one question, if I may. The first one, uh, uh, Ross, um, man, great talk, good stuff. You you know your stuff. And it's really thrilling to see a, a Cisindelist, Cisindelidist, <laughs> uh, tiger beetle guy. Uh, because you have to follow some of the quickest, most difficult, but also most exciting insects in the world uh, as they move. And that's not easy. And that makes a great observer. And of course, Cisindelas, the tiger beetles and the butterflies have a lot in common in that they have extremely devoted followers. So, uh, so excited to have you in the state working on this. Now, uh, my comments are, uh, Ross, the uh, history of the Oregon silver spot in Washington um, is really quite a simple one. It was known in the uh, teens, the 19 teens, primarily from the records of uh, Agnes Vesey and her daughter um, out on the Long Beach Peninsula, 1916, around there. Not very many records, but it was common there at the time. And then there's not much mention in the literature until the 50s when Dave McCorkle found it up in Grace Harbor County. Um, and then the rediscovery that took place in 1975 was not actually in the interdune communities. It was uphill from them in the forest openings, the forest glades at Lake Loomis State Park, thank heavens, a protected area. And from there, one went down into the interdunes. And then in the succeeding years, uh, we found that that's where the violets were. And Kathleen Sace and others uh, carried out survey for the next several years during a series of bad years in which it did in fact seem to drop out altogether, as I believe it has. So uh, as Dave McCorkle and Paul Hammond found in Oregon, it seems to require this bimodal habitat situation of both the interdunes or the salt spray meadow or at Mount Hebo, a little bit different, but always the uh, grassland with the, with the violets, but also the adjacent habitat of the forest where the gathering and the mating seems to take place. So it makes a very complicated uh, uh, management situation. On, uh, on the uh, uh, Taylor's checker spot, one comment. Uh, I, I differ or I take issue with the assumption that it is extirpated in the San Juans. And the reason I say that is that the biggest population, uh, both in size and numbers, the greatest abundance that I ever witnessed, other than the day that John Pelham and I we're at Rock Prairie, not Rocky Prairie, but Rock Prairie with Paul Ehrlich and Dennis Murphy, was on Long Island, not the one in Willapa Bay, but the little Long Island between the foot of Lopez Island and San Juan Island. Mm -hmm. And that was with Spencer Beebe when I worked for the Nature Conservancy in, I think, 1978, in April of 78. So we're only talking uh, 46 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but there, that day when we got off the, our little boat uh, on Long Island, there were thousands, mm -hmm. thousands over a wide area of marvelous um, San Juan Island meadow, just as good as the meadow at the foot of uh, uh, Goose and Deadman Islands. Now, that's a long time ago. Succession may have occurred, but that island has been owned by for a long time by, uh, as far as I know still, by a landowner who was adverse to conservation inquiries. And it's not easy um, for an agency person to trespass, he can't do it. Now, when I worked as an independent contractor for the National Park Service on the early surveys of Island Marble, I tried very hard to organize a pirate enterprise to trespass on the island and nobody could fire me from anything or some, my agent, <laughs> and see if the thing's still there. But you know, I talked with Anne about it a million times. And Judy, you've heard me say this a lot of times. But until we ascertain 
Whether that butterfly is still on Long Island or not, we cannot say, except it's extirpated from the San Juans. So a little, little invitation, little challenge, let's find some way to get somebody beyond the law, <laughs> willing to be. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I do. Do get out there and check that place out. Quick, you know, get off the boat, get on the land, check it out on a beautiful day in May and, and get back again. And uh, let's find out. My challenge. Okay, third thing, um, the uh, Arenas propertius, the propertius dusky wing in Western Washington. Darn right we should be looking at it because the populations are not large and extensive in Thurston. But I, there are five counties in Southwest Washington and Northwest Oregon that have oak and ought to have propertius. And I've looked a lot, uh, Ridgefield Refuge, other places, but uh, Columbia County, Oregon, but also Clark County, Washington, uh, Cowlitz County, the easternmost edge of Waukaikum County, Lewis County, and a little bit of Grace Harbor County, all have potential habitat. And that butterfly has not been found in any one of those. So we really ought to have a really aggressive uh, field survey for uh, oak, oak skippers in those counties. It can still be done this year. There's still time. <laughs> but let's plan it for next year. Uh, final comment before my question is, uh, uh, Ross, your absolutely spot on statement about how we got to keep uh, the data flowing in. Well, the uh, the methods we've been hearing about electronically are splendid. And I agree with John, one of the best things that's happened. But we also know that there is a little more flexidity, a little more porous, a little bigger filter than with voucher specimens or catch and release by, by uh, field researchers. And so uh, best way to keep the data coming in, you know this as a coleopterist, is keep the nets in the hands of the children, keep the nets in the hands of the amateurs as well as the professionals and encourage that um, resource appropriate, uh, regulation appropriate uh, research without onerous uh, uh, um, impediments to that. Keep those nets in the field and we'll keep the data coming in, which of course was the basis of your entire database for the past hundred years. People out in the field with nets. That's my last comment. And my question is this, and it may be a very selfish question because I might be the only person in this entire um, Zoom or maybe the whole group, even the ones who aren't here that it applies to. But um, as a deeply fought and, uh, and uh, a person without a great deal of uh, discipline, uh, I have not chosen to grace or encumber my life, take your pick, with a, with a smartphone. I had a flip phone, but I left it on the train the other day. I do not do electronic reporting in any of these means. I don't need to. Just like I quit photography when the digital divide came. I was a pioneer of butterfly photography with simple, cheap equipment. When people started doing it well, and a lot of them, I said, great, go to it. Same thing here. Other people are doing that. I'm not going to do that. And it's way too late for me to start. So my question is simply this. For those of us, even if I'm the only one, who still uh, relies on their for their tools on the net, uh, binoculars, and a pen and a pencil, and then the computer eventually at home with the Google Maps and and uh, and uh, uh, word processing, will you still accept data by the traditional means? And that's my question. And thank you so much for your contributions tonight and to conservation. Are you asking me if I'm going to accept your data? No, I know no. you will. No, <laughs> no. I, I'm so glad you asked that, Bob, because we have a backup plan. Um, I talked about with Paulette earlier, talked about with Ross, talked about with earlier, like what if people are like, I don't have a phone or I don't want to use my phone in that way. Um, yes, we accept data by the traditional means. Um, and John actually sent me a template of an Excel spreadsheet. And I don't know, maybe that's too fancy. Yeah, I don't use spreadsheets either. It's okay. Too, okay. <laughs> Not DOC. I, I think I think you're well versed in the important uh data points, right? The the where, the when, yes. the the what, the how, those only, only for 60 years, Julie. Yes. So 
So you have that information. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to put that in an email to John or Ross or myself, uh, and especially for Ross and I, if it's an SGCN species, we would yeah. take, if it comes from you, I would just send that to Sarah Croc, who was our data biologist, and she would put it in as a point. Just well, boom, lickety split. I figured that would be your answer, my darling. And uh, <laughs> and you don't have too much longer to deal with me. So, <laughs> but you'll be getting it. Don't worry. Well, and I do want to, so that is one way. And then another way, so this Excel spreadsheet, um, John um, has a template that you can fill out with all of those details. Um, I also, I'm glad um, Melanie's here because I know she leads a lot of field trips. And so I wanted to put a plug in you know, you guys have had some amazing field trips planned uh, this um, this season, and it would be so wonderful if um, whoever the field trip organizer is, um, maybe not if it's David James, because I know he doesn't like to do that either, but if there's somebody in the group um, that wants to collate the species list, the SGCN species, but the common, everything you've seen that day in that place, um into one into one place and i was thinking oh wouldn't that be great if it was like posted on the website along with the trip details or um posted in the newsletter or or some way that we could also have information regarding um what you're finding on these field trips and how wonderful that would be to track over time and so okay. i guess i just wanted to open that discussion up to people um, to see maybe you've done it in the past or or some ideas about uh, or or just some thoughts if you think good idea bad idea other uh, other ways to to provide data Julie oh, um, yeah we have, we've been talking about that for quite a while and have um, the, the some of the issues are do we want to give that job to in addition to leading the trip to entering the data because it is somewhat time consuming, particularly if you see quite a few butterflies. And we also have considered um, putting it on the web, but I'm, I really appreciate all the information you two have given today and the alternate ways that even just zeroing it, we'll have to talk about it at the next board meeting, um, You know how we can um, help you and, and really do it this time and not just talk about it, but maybe zeroing in to start with on those um, those 21 species, I think might be a, a good way for us to start. So um, I'll make sure we talk about it. Great. Yeah, so one option would be, because I know people have expressed concern in the past about putting this information on the web, afraid people will come and trample the habitat to come see the butterflies. That's we enough. can just send feel, our field trip species list directly to you, Julie. Um, I mean, they yeah. won't have exact locations like they would on INAT or something like that. And there would not necessarily be photos. I mean, people do take photos, but it might be a lot to try to collate all those photos with the species list. Yeah. But we can send you a list, even yeah. if we decide not to put it online. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I, if there's not photos, I, I assume that there's a, an expert in that mix that yes. that verifies the 12 the 15, Julie 30, Julie you you're, you're talking to one right Mel right Melody. are you going uh, right so so i assume there's an expert so the photos i guess are great but they're not necessary if I, if if we can just assume that yes there's somebody that verifies the species and having that list and sending it to Ross myself and John cuz he wants it too i'm sure well, also, um, if there is any question, you know, so there will be several of us who will look at it and make a designation. And if there's a question, we do send it on to John often and he'll do the final say so, which he's very kind to do that. Yeah, Melanie takes a lot of photos and she takes really good photos. It's hard for me to get good photos that show all the identifying characteristics because I don't have her equipment. And I don't have her patience. I mean, she'll just be <laughs> down on the ground waiting for the butterfly to cooperate. She gets excellent photos, and they will have the identifying characteristics. Thank Mine, you. not so much. <laughs> kind of you. So, um, John Bauman, we haven't heard from you, and I know you're a trip leader. Do you have any comments on, um, you know, the 
uh, challenges or the utility of, of um, this kind of data entry? I don't. I like what I see here, and I'm ready to use it. I have been using iNaturalist. Um, sometimes people don't step up to uh, verify the species that I think that I know, but um, I don't mind doing the some of the easier ones that uh, people send in for this area. I'm just not sure how to get access to other people's uh, uh, sightings when they send them in, but I'd be happy to help if I could. Um, secondly, I just put in a question that is kind of involved, but basically I'm trying to figure out what sort of changes uh, you folks at the state level might have seen with this SGCN list uh, since Ann Potter's time, because she had us looking for five species. I remember that. Um, yeah, there were two Bellorians, uh, the monarch, uh, the, uh, the Grinus, Neo's hair streak. Yes. And um, yeah. gosh, yeah. one other one. And it yeah. looked like maybe a couple of Politi skippers are being uh, added in, but the I'd like to see on that. Pardon? Because the monarch also we were looking and, for. And the yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I think I remember Anne, um, maybe she gave a presentation here uh, regarding those five SGCN species. Um, and uh, as far as our swap, there has not been changes. So, and Ross was uh, alluding to earlier, you know, uh, the need for us to do species status assessments and um, the fact that um, there are many butterflies on the east side that, that deserve to be SGCN. Um, and we are also toying with a category of um, species of greatest information need as well. So we might be adding a new category, which will expand the scope uh, of species um, that we'll be looking at. Um, but we are right at the front end of that. And so um, I would not be surprised if there were more Eastern Washington uh, butterflies. And I would love to hear your nomination, John. Um, if you have any, I would love to hear people's like, what are the east side species what that you're not looking at? And uh, so uh, anyway, just interested. I will do uh, let me ponder that. John, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, we I think we've got enough people that we could have a, a joint discussion on that matter, you know. I'd like John to from the east side, you know. Uh I would love to see a uh in the same way that the grassland surveys. Of the uh, 80s and 90s that Anne and John Fleckenstein and others conducted, ended up with the spectacular results of more mm -hmm. uh, checker spot populations and the rediscovery mm -hmm. of the island marble, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a grassland survey of the Northeast, mm -hmm. and particularly the Guild of Skippers, uh, the several skippers that are, uh, as far as state distribution goes, endemic to the Northeast. And now we know uh, Mystic comes a little farther, Long Dash comes a little farther south and west than I realized. And uh, and others, they may be moving in the same way the Mystic has in Colorado and elsewhere. But those several skippers, the Mysticles, uh, the Tawny Edge Skipper, the uh, Yellow Patch Skipper, or of course, what do we call it, Pex? Pex Skipper, is that Pex, one of them? Pex, yeah, uh, has lots of common names. And uh, that's right. And also the Mystic or Long Dash, those three uh, particularly, uh, what is their their range? Are they expanding, and are they uh, are they consistently safe in the places they are? Don't you think that'd make a good target, John? And John, oh yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I think that that's another aspect too. It's not uh, uh, you know individual species. It's actual habitat types. You know, like sagebrush meadows, tiger meadows. You know, there's all these different kinds of uh, highly biodiverse areas that. Really, your butterflies are only indicator species for. They're very biodiverse in, in a whole, um, you know, spectrum of other organisms, mostly um, invertebrate. So, like, yeah, Bob's suggestion is spot on in that sense because, you know, we can uh, through our looking at butterflies identify habitats that are, you know, very biodiverse and have importance for um, all kinds of reasons besides butterflies. Yeah, and then we got to be looking at the top of the mountain things too with the. Uh with the warming, you know, keep a close eye on Melissa Arctics and uh, nasty sulfurs, Labrador sulfurs, and the uh, uh, 
um, the uh, Arctic skippers and, and those, you know, I mean, the, what do we call it? The Alpine, the Alpine checkered skipper. <laughs> uh, uh, is that Bernsia, John? Bernsia? No, Cent no, it's Pyrgis. It's still Pyrgis. It's Pyrgis, Pyrgis. Pyrgis Centauri. Centauri. Those, we, yeah, because those could be ones really in grave danger of popping off or not. We don't know. So let's get a lot of surveys up there. Did you say nasty skipper or nasty sulfur? Yeah, lavender or sulfur, whatever it's called. I Coleus, like that. Coleus nasties. Oh, I'm not nasties, nasty. Or it could be that too, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be seeing it in this state. I've finally figured out that uh, there's about four or five Washington butterflies that I have never seen in Washington. And that species I've never seen anywhere. And I'm not probably going to be doing it at this point because I think Horseshoe Meadows is, and that's the easiest place. That's beyond me now, I think. But uh, I am going to go up with David Branch right after the uh, Waba weekend and try to see the uh, pallid, the pale crescent up at uh, up in the Okanagan. But somebody ought to be getting up, not just to Horseshoe Meadows, though. And that was a good point you made. One of you made, Julie or Ross. Uh, not just the old places. That's right. Let's get people into the other Alpine places that have not received survey. And very few people have been have been willing to do that with a backpack or a pack animal. And well, the, the biodiversity grant that I mentioned earlier would be a good place for somebody to develop a proposal to do exactly that. And thinking about having an SGCN species or a suite of SGCN species in mind that may or may not be there um, or potential, have the potential habitat. Um, like I mentioned, May 5th is the deadline for proposals, but it will be available again next year. And a big part of that effort, a uh, big part of the priorities for us is really to learn about, um, you know, having people do surveys exactly where you're talking about, where yeah. where people have not done surveys. Um, yeah, if, if anybody else here is a member of the uh, Washington Native Plant Society, you may have noticed in their good newsletter, about a project they've had for uh, people to get up to the tops of lots of mountains in the Cascades and to survey the plants on top of them. Great series of, uh, of, of, of field studies up there and reports on it. And I, I told David Giblin, the, the uh, creator of plants at the UW, the, you know, the keeper of the herbarium, that if only we'd had a net along on those mountaintop surveys, we could know so much more. So we got to we got to emulate that with people with uh, nets and cameras. Absolutely, I love the idea of Washington Butterfly Association collaborating with the Native Plant Society and going on similar um, trips with them, um, working in unison. Um, I know uh, Wendy Gibble, uh, who works for Rare Plant Care. She's the manager working on that conservation group, um, but she's also uh wanting to collaborate with entomologists to come um, and conduct surveys uh with their group um david okay. jennings just popped on maybe is david is the is the washington bee society um native bee society working with uh wendy gibble oh well, we're working with the rare plant group and they're taking us with them to figure out what pollinators Yes. Are, are with those rare plants. Yes, that's Wendy Gibble's um, group with the Washington um, Rare Care. Um, they track the rare plants in Washington and do monitoring and surveying. And it sounds like they're really interested in ramping up learning about pollinator communities. And so reached out to, to your society. And I'm really excited about that collaboration. And I just want to jump in and say um, the third Thursday of this month at seven o'clock, for the Native Bee Society, we're actually having Dr. Giblin talk about how to use his floral databases to track down the plants that we want to look for special bees on. So well, there might be an opportunity for the same thing for butterflies if people want to tune into that talk, how to use the tools. We got exposed to those tools uh, in the Oregon project, and it was just, it's just an amazing resource. You can figure out you know, where the plant is on the landscape and when it blooms, you know, and where the various populations are. So it makes it a lot easier to target for those uh, less common bees and butterflies if you know the host plant that they're going to be using. I like the uh, Iris 10X and the bee behind you, David. Is that Iris 10X? 
No, that's uh, I want, that's the uh, Nevada bumblebee, Nevadensis. Yeah, but what's the what's the plant? Is Iris stenax? Oh, I think so. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, it is up near. Uh, uh, there's a butte near uh, Davenport that I walked up, found it there. Beautiful. Um, Allison, did you want to um, weigh in? Um, you put a comment in the chat, but I don't know if Joe, Julie has seen it. Julia Ross, could you could you unmute? Yeah, hi. So I put a comment in about the NABA, the North American Butterfly Association. And for a lot of years, the Washington Butterfly Association put did these counts and put them in NABA. And, and I haven't noticed them coming in the last few years, but those are available. And some of them I think are a couple decades. Oh, that's very true. Yes, um, they Al Wagar used to lead those, and um, it's and then what, there was another gentleman who passed away unfortunately the last couple of years. He also was, um, I think, one of the primary consistent leaders of that. So I think there's just no one who's taken it on since then. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, maybe that was the yeah, chumps look into out. that. And yeah, recreate. But that would be great. Yeah, it was it was a fun count, and we had watermelon at the top. People would come up different sides, and then we'd all gather the data at the end and eat watermelon. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but it sounds like but, I was that, saying that, that those data were collected, and um, I don't know if John Pelham has them or if they're if they're in a system that. Um, Somebody is using Print Atlas. Do you know that or? Come on, Paulette. I was on a lot of those trips. I can't kept all that data. Um, yeah. No, they're they're at NAVA. So that NAVA has the databases, and then as the regional editor, I get to go through them and make sure there's nothing crazy in there. And because NAVA has a very conservative when it comes to species, I have to change all the Anna's blues to northern blues and put yeah. in a note that the Pacific Northwest Lepidopterus recognized them as Anna's and not northerns and I do that for a bunch of the species but there's ways to contact NABA if you're state agencies or researchers and you can get those historic data lists so you could you could track some trends. Now sometimes people aren't great, like I put in the example, Ackman blue versus lupin blue, and you'll see, oh, for three years, they saw all these Ackman blues and no lupins. And then for one year, they saw a bunch of lupin blues and no Ackmans. Well, who knows? They were one or the other of those. So there's some of those species that you have to go, okay, that might be this or that might be that, but you can see the trends. That reminds me, John uh, and Ross, I uh, noticed in the uh, list of 21 that the, uh, and by the way, what what is the suffix you're using, Ross and Julie? Was it DPS? It's what we would call a segregate, I guess. What segregate. Is, what's DPS? What's that stand for? Distinct population segment. Good. Thank you. And But I noticed the one you're using for the uh, Puget Trough uh, uh, branded, Western branded. Uh, you were saying uh, Hesperia comma. I think you're calling that Colorado. Colorado, yes. Colorado subspecies comma. Yeah. No, uh, Colorado DCS, whatever. The former Oregonia. But uh, I think the former Oregonia, which isn't Oregonia, right, John? No, the Oregonia type locality is uh, Trinity County, California. Right. There's nothing you're... in the Northwest that has anything to do with that name. Unfortunately, the uh, the person that revised it last in uh, 1962 was that Burns, or 64. Um, he, he didn't know any better. And everyone got stuck with that name. It's not Oregonia. It's an unnamed thing. And calling it sadly segregate makes sense because that's its distribution. It's from yeah, Vancouver you're... Island. Thank but you, you are con to the prairies. Sorry, but you are considering it uh, a segregate of Colorado, not comma, right? And yeah, the no comma is only in Alaska and North America. Yeah, so that's a slight correction to make to the uh, to the list. 
Yeah, we'll get that worked out. That's yeah. not a problem. Yeah, yeah. Small stuff. Ross, yeah. thanks for your kind words. Absolutely. He says something nice about you. Oh, I can't believe it, can you, John? I'm going to have to make up for it, I guess. I know. You've been working on it for over 50 years. 60 years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, any other comments from, from folks? Um, there's some comments in the chat. If somebody wants to un unmute and, and um, uh, comment, you know, you're welcome to do that. So, Bob Parsons, you're going to be up in Ione. Have a good look at those skippers in those grasslands. Let us know what you see. What what is uh what does this comment mean that there is a man in Pen Pendere area who's doing 4JBC? What does that mean? Fourth of July oh. butterfly oh. count. <laughs> Sorry. Jeez, I should know that. <laughs> yeah, Idaho Idaho has several Fourth of July butterfly count locations that they've been fairly consistent at for, for quite a while, but usually getting those folks to organize the as trip leaders or folks to manage and submit the data is usually the biggest hurdle. There's been some folks who've been leading those for quite a while uh, and right. getting people to adopt them is, is difficult. But yeah, when you look at the nat, the, the map, there's, there's no current ones that I found in Washington, at least with the current data on the, the NAVA website, but there's quite a few in Idaho. Yeah. Sadly, the uh, jump stick no longer has a leader and doesn't take place anymore. I don't think jump stick was a good count for a long time. Uh, but it's very hard to maintain consistency, which is why uh, it's a little bit difficult to use the uh, 4JBC data in a consistent comparative way. Um, they're valuable if they're kept in context. Yeah. But it's hard, as you say, Ross, it's hard to keep them going. Oh, I want to recognize Don Rolfs. His name has been mentioned a couple of times here. He recently passed away. He was an extremely important mentor to me. Um, he started out in butterflies, and um, before he died, he donated 4,000 of his butterfly uh, specimens to WSU, and I've actually been meaning to talk to Ross about this, that that that's one of those like piles of wonderful data sitting there that needs to be unearthed and brought to a database. John has a lot of that information. He was corresponding with Don Rolves through much of his career. Um, and, um, I met Don Rolfs, uh, when I was doing uh, my master's degree, uh, looking at seed predators, specialist weevils, uh, and on rare plants. And then my PhD work moved to pollinators and bumblebees. And then Don Rolfs came on board and, and he joined me in the field and he decided he's done with butterflies. Sorry, butterfly people, but he's like, I'm done with butterflies. And then for the next 15 years of his career, he devoted himself to uh, the native bees of Washington and has an enormous collection. Um, and uh, David Jennings and Lisa Robinson are working uh, and Karen Wright and others are working on um, identifying those um, those specimens um, to uh, contribute to databases. And Katie Buckley is part of that crew. Uh, I see her here tonight. Um, that's important with the with the native bees, uh, um, the information we're getting about native bees of Washington State. But Don Rolfs used to lead that 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 uh trip in Wenatchee the jump and, stick count, yeah. on Chumstick Mountain and it was always like I I've saw lists of it in the past but incredibly diverse oh we had um, 55 species one year yeah so who 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 can pick that up is there anybody here in Wenatchee <laughs> exactly we need somebody to pick that count up we just had watermelon too so you got to have watermelon yes the watermelon was great so um, I look back at my emails to see who the guy was in Pondere, and it's Mike Muntz, who was a wildlife biologist um, for the National Wildlife Refuge. But the last email I have from him is from 2017. So I don't know if he's still around or not. I don't think I've gotten any records from him uh, since 2017. So I don't know. I know Joel Sauter is running the next closest 4th of July butterfly count, and he might still be in contact with them or know kind of the status of that. Where's that, that spot? Where is that one? Joel's based out of Lewiston, and I think that's the uh, uh, Seven Devils. There's oh, the yeah. Seven Devils butterfly count, and I think yeah. he's been kind of coordinating that with a few others. 
Good. Julie, I have to say that uh, I appreciated your, your phrase, piles of data. It's a good way to use the collected noun. There are other ways I appreciate less. <laughs> well, there's piles and there's piles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, Chris, you have some information. Can you share it with us? Other than Mike is still running the annual bird count or the annual uh, butterfly count, he does a bird count too. Um, and as recently as last year, I don't know um, where his information goes. Which count are you talking about, Chris? Little uh, Ponderay Wildlife area. Refuge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. He's notorious for not returning emails, though. So if uh, your experience is similar to mine, and I live like four blocks from him, <laughs> you can walk over there. Yeah. Hi, Melanie. Yeah, bye, Melanie. Melanie needs to go. So um... thanks, Melanie. Thank you. So she's put in the chat that um, she'll start making sure that um, lists from our field trips uh, from WBA are, are made available to y'all, so. Ross, this is where we do our dance. Mm -hmm. Our happy <laughs> dance. Yeah, yeah. He's like, uh, come on. I don't me. dance. I do go to Texas. You got cowboy boots. You could do the, you could do something. The two steps. I dance with a net in my hand, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, got to leave, guys. You guys are great. Very See fun program. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, for doing Thanks everybody. Thanks for great meeting you. Thanks for Thank doing you the so work. Thank you so much, Julie, yeah. Ross, and Regina. And uh, it sounds like we have some things to talk about at our next uh, board meeting. So, okay. Well, this is our last um, uh, program for this season. We're going to have our field season. So look at the website for the field trips coming up. And then we'll resume with our uh, meetings again in September. So thank you again so much, uh, Julie, Ross, and Regina. And happy May Day. Well, really happy like. to be here. Happy May, May Day. Day. Yeah. May Day, May Day, May Day. <laughs> and have a great, uh, great field season, everybody. We'll see you next, next time. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.